So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the annual Robert F. E. Steer Lecture. I'm Daryl Dewald. I'm the Vice President of Health Sciences, and I'm the Chancellor of the WSU Spokane campus. We have a great turnout today, and it's exciting to see many of you eager to hear more from our guest speaker, Dr. O'Connell. Our topic today centers around medicine. And I want to take a few moments to share milestones that are currently happening around this topic in relation to our students. So in just about a month, 57 students will be our first graduates of our inaugural WSU Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine. They began their journey in August of 2017. And it's been fascinating and enjoyable to watch and follow and participate with them on this journey. We're very proud of you and what you've done. And just last week, the medical students were part of what we all know as Match Day. This is when the med students or those in their fourth year learn of their residency and fellowship training positions in the National Resident Matching Program. After what could be three up to seven years of training, the hope is that they will return to this state to practice medicine. We even have some of our medical students joining us today eager to hear what Dr. O'Connell will say and how he will share with us his experiences. And these students are working with Spokane Street Medicine, which provides outreach services to vulnerable members of our community who are living homeless and in shelters, a topic that our guest speaker knows very well. This is a historic time for WSU and for our College of Medicine, and we're very proud of what these future physicians have done. And we look forward to the positive changes that they will make in the world, in healthcare, and in medicine. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Vice Chancellor for research at WSU Health Sciences, Celestina Barbosa Liker. Celestina is going to share some history on this dear lecture. Thank you, Daryl. It's so great to see many of you joining us here today. And another shout out to our first medical students, our first class of medical students. It's an exciting time for all of you and for all of us here at WSU. So I wanna talk just a little bit about how we got here today. In 1921, Dr. Robert F. E. Steer and Guy Hollister started the first clinical laboratory in Spokane outside of the hospitals and prepared their first batch of allergy medicine. The company grew into the International Hollister Steer Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Company that still has a division right here in Spokane. Robert F. E. Steer's influence in this community extended to medical practice, teaching, and business that helped to make Spokane the medical and educational center that we see it as today. His two sons joined together to honor their father with the Robert F. E. Steer Lecture in Medicine at WSU Spokane. As part of that, lectures began in 1996, featuring leaders whose works have in increased understanding of new technologies and as we'll see today, challenging issues. And that is why the annual lecture continues. We are truly grateful to the support of the Steer family and continuing the legacy of Robert F.E. Steer. I'm now gonna send things over to Dr. Gwen Hallis, our Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs here at WSU Health Sciences Spokane to introduce our distinguished guest, Gwen. Thank you, Celestina. It's wonderful to hear about the legacy left by Robert F. E. Steer and knowing that through him, we can hear from others like our guest today. It's my true honor to introduce Dr. Jim O'Connell. Dr. O'Connell has an undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame, a master's degree in theology from Cambridge University and his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. That is where I met Jim and was impressed with his thoughtfulness and compassion. Dr. O'Connell has an, uh, completed an internal medicine residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. Following residency, he began his work with homeless individuals as the founding physician of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program, 
which now serves over 13,000 homeless persons a year in two hospital-based clinics and in more than 60 shelters and outreach sites in Boston. With colleagues, Dr. O'Connell established the nation's first medical respite program that provides acute and subacute, pre and post-operative, palliative and end-of-life care in the 104-bed Barbara McGinnis House. Working with the MGH Laboratory of Computer Science, Dr. O'Connell designed and implemented the nation's first computerized medical record for a homeless program in 1995. Dr. O'Connell practices street medicine in the clinic, on the streets, and in house calls in Boston. Dr. O'Connell is the editor of the Healthcare of Homeless Persons, a manual of communicable diseases and common problems in shelters and on the streets. His articles have appeared in numerous medical journals. He's been featured on national TV networks and in the documentaries, Give Me a Shot of Anything, House Calls for the Homeless and The Antidote, which I would highly recommend. He has received eight honorary doctorates and has received numerous awards, including the Albert Schweitzer Human Humanitarian Award. Dr. O'Connell has collaborated with homeless programs nationally and internationally. His book, Stories from the Shadows, Reflections of a Street Doctor, was published in 2015. Welcome, Dr. O'Connell. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hollis. It's um, a, certainly a pleasure to be here. And um, let me, let me, uh, begin by offering my thanks as well to the Steer family for, uh, for inviting me and for letting me do this. It's such a treat to see everyone. Um, I also want to add my congratulations. I am so blown away by uh, your, your medical school as I read about your young history and the energy and um, the reasons for your existence and the mission you have is really admirable. And to all the students who might still be here, um, my really heartfelt congratulations. You are truly pioneers. And I can't wait to watch how your careers unfold after such an opportunity. Uh, but let me uh, step into, I think what I'd love to do this evening is just give you a sort of a little overview of the kind of the challenges and the difficulties and the joys of caring for a very vulnerable population, um, whether you're homeless in a city or out in a suburb or out in the country, it's a really difficult existence. And um, the healthcare needs um, become magnified by the social determinants of health, as you know. But just to give you a little, uh, you know, a little inkling of my own learning, because I knew nothing about homelessness when I took this job uh, back in 1985. Um, there are just some really fascinating uh, things that we don't learn in medical school very easily. At least I certainly didn't. Um, I think now we're starting to understand them a little bit better. But this was the first time, this is Pine Street Inn, and I finished my residency, you know, in end of June and July 1st. I was here at the shelter as a doctor in a clinic, along with uh, several other clinics and uh, several other shelters in Boston, where we have many. But I remember walking in and the, there was a nurse's clinic there. Uh, that had been going for a long time, and they were very, um, they were fiercely independent. They were extremely and appropriately skeptical of us doctors because we hadn't done such a good job of, of taking care of homeless people. Um, and they really were, um, they were really stern but wonderful taskmasters. Um, and interestingly, on that summer that I began, the uh, clinic at Pine Street and was on the cover of the American Journal of Nursing as one of the only independently uh, licensed nurses clinic in the country. And you can see this man who I grew to love and take care of for many years was soaking his feet in the clinic at Pine Street. And that was the brilliance of the nurses where they invited people in. They didn't you know, ask them if they're hearing voices or having chest pain or all the things I had been taught to do, but they just wanted to know if there's anything they could do to help. They called everyone by their name. They would always say, you know, Mr. Roberts, please come in. And I was astonished by people lighting up because many homeless people, as you probably know, never hear anyone say their name with dignity for months at a time. So just that expression of dignity and then the offer of soaking someone's feet or comfort thing was pure magic to me. Um, and I also, you know, as I started, the nurses had me soak a lot of feet and I started to learn a lot about how to flip the power structures 
in our the way we usually do it. I, I realized that when I was listening to someone's heart and lungs, I was right smack in their their uh, personal space. And for people that are very scarred by life on the streets, you know that personal space can be too too tight. So taking care of their feet gives you lots of distance and gives a person a lot of time to adjust to who you are. So uh, we have a rule, a principle in our uh, program that says whenever you're in doubt, just start with the feet, and the feet are the entry to the soul. So I would urge you to do that. And then I had to realize it um, or come to understand that homeless people are eclectic. There are all sizes and shapes. People come from all sorts of walks of life. And there was no easy generalization of who was homeless. So uh, I sh share this picture because I ran into this man the first night I started. He was 92 years old at the time, older than my grandmother at the time. And uh, those are two of the nurses taking care of him. And he had been at the shelter for somewhere, somewhere more than 50 years. He had a very special place to sit to have dinner. It was his life. Um, and he was treated with great kindness and great respect by all the, the shelter guests. So I started to take care of him. I um, really tried hard to talk him into going to a nursing home or something else. And he kept, you know, pushing me off and saying, no, I, you know, this is my home. This is where I live. And um, I took care of him until he died at the shelter. He literally died at the shelter when he was 96 years old. So I remember thinking, you know, uh, I have to frame shift everything I'm thinking about, trying to decide what is it that people want. And I also had my comeuppance with this really delightful man whose first name was Emerigo. And he came up to me one day. He was a, a person that if you've ever been in a shelter, he was kind of the gadfly. He was always laughing. You could hear his laugh above everybody else. There were 800 people in the shelter, but when he was laughing, you knew it was Emerigo. And he was a character. But he came up in one night with his customary kind of, you know, you know, hurry up, doc. Thing he said, Doc, you got to do something. And I said, Why? What's going on, Enrico? And he looked at me and he said, I cannot swallow. And he held up his bottle of vodka and he said, I can't swallow this vodka anymore. Now, uh, you know, in my training, I had yet to have that as a chief complaint, just so you know. So I was kind of taken aback, but also started to think this must be really serious because what I had come to understand within weeks of starting is that most homeless people don't complain about things until it doesn't function. So they don't complain about a little knee pain, a little back pain, a little arm pain, but it's only when they can't move the arm or can't swallow that they come and say, here's what's going on. And when we did the uh, workup with him, he had a huge esophageal cancer, big cancer in the middle of his, um, where he swallowed, that was preventing any, any food or liquid from going through. And when I talked to him about it, he said, oh, I have, I've been having trouble swallowing any food for a long time. He said, but I could get my vodka down and I was okay. Uh, so it turns out we couldn't do any surgery, couldn't do any chemotherapy because it was too far advanced and too spread. So I spent the weekend saying, I am not going to let this man die in a shelter. We have to find him a dignified place to, to die. And I got him a, I found a nursing home in South Boston, which was the neighborhood where he'd grown up. It was right on the waterfront. So it had a view of the water. Spent most of the weekend, this is before computers, filling out all the paperwork to get him in. And on Monday, brought him over there. And he was, I think, grateful to have a chance to go see it. And I thought maybe, you know, I've finally done something good. And I wanted the nurses to be proud of me. Uh, and I came back about three days later. I was at the shelter and coming down the, the alleyway and in going into the side door of the shelter, I could hear his voice. By the way, I, ooh, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that um, in order to bypass this uh, esophageal tumor, we had to put in a tube and feed him via the tube, which, which is what you can see here. Um, so as I was coming down, he was laughing with his friends and having a great time. And I was like ready to kill him. Like, Emery, go, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be in the nursing home. And he pulled me aside and he said, look, doc, you know, I know you've been trying to do the right thing. But he said, the truth is, when I got to that nursing home, after a couple of days, I was going nuts. Nobody was talking to me. Everybody was just watching TV or staring into space. I didn't know anybody. He said, I don't want to die in a place like that. He said, this is where I've been for 30 years. These are my friends. And he wanted to die in the shelter, exactly the place that I thought was inhumane for a person to die. And so um, I had to be Begin to realize what all of us do when you start to take care of people. It's really centered on what somebody wants. And our job is to try to corral our, our skills and, and facilitate that. So the nurses, as you can see here, were fabulous with Emerigo. They did help with the tube feeds three times a day. They let him stay in a special part of the shelter where he would have his own bed. 
Um, and he stayed at the shelter. This was the first um, palliative care we did and end of life care we did in the shelter that I remember is back in 1985. And he died in the shelter actually where he wanted to be surrounded by his friends, even though I had started thinking that was going to be a horrible death. Um, one of the things I should mention is that in our program, uh, you know, as we learn about homelessness, there's family homelessness and adult homelessness and then sort of youth homelessness. And in our program, we've had to divide up the family shelters look very different in Boston. They're very small. They're in the neighborhoods, um, usually very well run, very safe places. This is a project called Project Hope run by a group of very, very um, radical nuns who are wonderful. And it's a just a fabulous place with lots of classes. It's probably, you know, all, all sorts of support. Um, and the, the women and the families love to be there. Um, when the shelters are full though, the kids and the families get sent to motels. And when I started, there were close to 2000 Boston families in motels because the shelters were too crowded. They took this picture of this young kid playing in this motel parking lot. And I started to realize the trauma that kids would go through when they were out in a, you know, with their mom and usually two or three brothers and sisters in a hotel motel room. Um, and the only entertainment they had was a TV. Uh, there was no place to shop. They had to eat processed food. And the only playground was this parking lot, as you can see here. And the toll it has taken on kids, I know, um, is more, um, more detrimental than we understand. And I know that when I took these pictures, the, the, the likelihood was that these two kids would end up homeless themselves. And I lost touch with one of them, but the other one is indeed homeless and in living in one of the shelters right now. Um, this is what the motels look like. You know, it's places, the rooms are rented by the hour, by the day, you know, by the week, you name it. It's all sorts of interesting traffic um, and just not a great place for kids to go. Plus, they're uprooted from where their school system was back in the city or, or in the other, and now they're out in a in one of the suburbs, having to start a new school system. And that, as you all know, is traumatic for the kids. This is our nurse practitioner. We used to, to do clinic, we would actually rent a room, a, a motel room and convert it into our clinic and have the moms bring their kids and we do all the well child care and everything else there. It was actually taking care of the kids was just a joy. Um, and I had mentioned earlier, and I wanted to emphasize here again, and one of the, one of the um, guiding principles of our program that was put in place by the homeless people that were involved with the mayor when we were first started back in 1985, is that the people that we serve, homeless folks, have to be involved in the in planning any of our stuff. They have to be involved in planning of the model of care, and they are part of the governance of our program. So I took this picture about a year ago um, of the four homeless people who uh, are good friends now and are on our board of directors. They are also on our consumer advisory board, which is a much bigger board, but they are elected by the other consumers to be part of our 15 member board of directors. And they are, their stories would blow you away. Um, and they are unbelievably magnanimous with their time and their efforts and taking care of us. And we could talk about them for a long time. I love this picture because the man sitting in his wheelchair recently died. And when he was placed in housing many years ago, he did a video for the National Consumer Advisory Board, a, a video that he really wanted to share with other homeless people to let them know that what happens when you go from the streets, years and years on the streets into housing and the, and the things that can bedevil you in that. And he was very articulate and that video was seen by most homeless people at the national conferences. Uh, the thing that I would remember and share with you that uh, was most um, interesting to me is he couldn't sleep when he got into his new housing. And the reason he couldn't sleep, it was perfectly quiet. And he had never slept in quiet before. And it actually truly drove him a little bit crazy. And what he ended up doing, I thought this was brilliant. He went down and our, our program's main office is across from the emergency room, which is a wild, it's the busiest um, trauma center in New England. And so he sat outside with a tape recorder and he taped uh, about an hour of the sounds of the ambulances coming, and going, people yelling and all of that. And he played that tape repeatedly all night to get himself to go to sleep. I thought that was an interesting perspective on the way things would be. But that the, the people that put us together were very concerned about several things, but one in particular that I love to share with you, we spoke a little bit about earlier today, was what they called respite care. And they were 
furious with us, the doctors in the hospitals, for admitting people when they're very sick, but as soon as they're okay and don't need the hospital anymore, they get discharged. And when you get discharged back to the streets or the shelters, that means you're walking around outside essentially most of the day when you are really sick and recovering from usually very, very critical things. So they insisted that we as a program had to come up with some place where people who were just not so sick they need to need an expensive hospital bed, but way too sick to be out on the streets or trying to withstand the rigors of survival on the streets on their own. So we were given in 1985, 25 beds, and we started what was we called a respite program because that was the word the homeless folks used. And, um, and I could talk to you a lot about what the different uh, issues were that came up. But basically we had to provide 24 seven care for people who really should be home with a visiting nurse, a home health aid, family supports, et cetera, but they don't have the advantage of that. Um, and uh, what I learned from looking at this picture, by the way, is that uh, um, very interestingly, the healthcare system has changed radically since this picture was taken in 1985. And most of the people that you're seeing right there had been uh, in the hospital for many weeks before they were discharged. And now in the sea changes that have happened, as you all know with hospitalizations, uh, hospital lengths of stay are incredibly brief. And many, many things that used to require a week or two in the hospital now are done as outpatient things. And homeless people have really lost out in this uh, thing. I'll give you an example. When I was a senior resident at MGH my last year, 1985, the average length of stay, if you came in for coronary artery bypass surgery, the average length of stay was four weeks to five weeks in the hospital. Um, that is now three days. And if you had cancer in need of chemotherapy, we always admitted you for at least a week to the hospital when you were getting your infusion, we waited for your counts to come up. Now, all of that is done as an outpatient. So you can imagine if you've got terrible cancer, you're living in the shelters on the streets, you get your chemotherapy in the morning, but you're walking around in these streets for the rest of the day. It's really pretty cruel when you step back and look at it from a, a wide lens. Um, we had some interesting things though. This man who was discharged from the hospital with this halo, because he had several fractures of his vertebrae. Um, and that halo was gonna to need to stay on for six weeks. And I remember thinking, you know, he can't really be outside safely, but we could take him into our respite program and take pretty good care of him. But the discharge summary came from the hospital. And I would just call your attention to the uh, history of the present illness says that this is a 46 year old bicyclist, notice he looks a lot older, was struck by a car with quote, impressive damage to the car. So um, you get a flavor for the kind of, um, reason homeless people were a little bit afraid to go to the hospital and felt a little stigmatized when they were there. Um, he turned out to be delightful, by the way, and that was no problem. Um, as time went on and we were putting up with a TB epidemic and the AIDS epidemic hit the homeless population, our little respite program became more and more acute. And we finally uh, moved into an old abandoned nursing home, which was not far from the shelter and opened up a what eventually was a 90 bed and we called it Barbara, the Barbara McGinnis house after the nurse who had uh, made us soak feet back in the beginning. And this was the first time we had any place of our own and we were able to do things like we had, this is Ernesto Gonzalez, a derm who was the head of dermatology at Mass General at the time. And he would come over with the residents and see all of our homeless folk, the, the uh, derm residents and see the homeless folks who had rashes and stuff like that. And that's most of our staff gathered around because we were desperate to learn dermatology from the best. Um, and it was just delightful. Um, it also gave us a chance to get to know people who were living outside. These are two men with a combined 64 years on the streets and they had come in and were doing really well in our respite program. The average length of stay is two to four weeks, by the way, it's not a long time, but this happened to be a particularly happy time. And this was in 2003, right? And it was the first time in 90 or 85 years the Red Sox won the World Series. And it was jubilation in the respite program. So we decided we love it when our sports teams win because there's a, there's a sort of a lifting of the, of the somberness of around and people kick real joy. Uh, we eventually in 2008 moved into uh, this building and we now have 104 beds of really intense, essentially step down hospital care, which is our respite program now. And I can show you what we do there is lots and lots of things. <clears throat> For example, most surgery right now that you get, you know, hernias, knee replacements, all of that stuff um, is done primarily as outpatient and homeless people need a place to both get ready for surgery and to recover from surgery. So we spend a lot of our time doing pre and post-operative care. 
Um, people who need IV antibiotics, um, which is, happens a lot, especially with um, a lot of the drug use that is going on, people are getting infectious um, joints and infected um, endocarditis, heart uh, valves. Um, but we also have um, had to learn how to do better and better, I hope better and better end of life care, palliative and end of life care. And this story is a particularly um, tender one for me because the man lying down is a guy named Tommy. He's 84 years old and he is dying in, in, in the last weeks of his life from a neurological uh, cancer, which is really spread everywhere. But his roommate, whose name is Byron, is only 37 years old and he has lung cancer that is metastatic to his brain and he also only has a few weeks to live. Um, and they became fast friends in their room here. And um, Byron, who is still quite um, mobile, would take a lot of good care of Tommy. But Tommy, uh, on the left, had been on the racetrack. We met him, and this is him taking care of horses on the racetrack. He, he, when he was like eight or nine years old, ended up as an orphan on the racetrack, and he stayed there. This is a thoroughbred racetrack, which is just on the outskirts of Boston. And he stayed there for essentially all of his life until now when he was dying. Um, and he's with a woman who is a really accomplished horsewoman there. Her name is Shirley. Um, and that is him in his healthy days. He, his home, by the way, was a tack room in the, uh, in the, in the barns there. He had a, a room essentially like the horses had. Um, and we had, I had never known this, but this is a, a really remarkable businessman lawyer who um, decided to just um, go to the racetrack and try to take care of people. He owned some horses and he set up a program for the workers at the racetrack. I knew nothing about this. He came into the office one day and sort of read me the riot act about where's the doctor who's supposed to be taking care of homeless people. And he dragged me out to the to uh, Suffolk Downs, the racetrack, and there were 1,500 thoroughbred horses stabled there being cared for by about 400 migrant homeless workers who had nothing. They worked long hours, were paid each day under the table, no health care, no benefits. And on the racetrack, there's not even any fair labor laws. So he asked us to set up a clinic. And I remember we, um, this is our nurse, what we realized our staff love these folks. We set up a clinic there in a, in a uh, trailer that they got for us. And they worked so hard, they would never leave work. We had to go to them. And this is Trish, our nurse, doing a follow-up on a guy who had a strep throat. Um, I also learned, by the way, from this picture that goats, when you have a very, you may all know this because you live in a different country than I do, but um, the goats are brought in for the very high, strong uh, stallions, particularly, and the goats, for some reason, keep them calm. And somebody may tell me why. But anyway, um, Jim and Shirley, who uh, this is a picture which is an inside joke because we had never seen either one of them in a shirt and tie or dress. And they won a big award for what they were doing on the on what they call the backstretch of the thing, trying to provide health and other care for um, these uh, these really vulnerable people. And they won this award. This is a uh, Penny Chenery Tweedy, who was the owner of Secretariat, um, who won the Triple Crown back in 1973. And she was the sponsor of a big award trying to get the racetracks to take better care of the backstretch workers. Um, but anyway, when Byron, what, what, when, as Tommy was dying, all he wanted to do, he was too infirm to be on the racetrack himself, but all he wanted to do each day was say, can you take me and just let me go back and see the horses? So once a week in the last uh, months of his life, uh, Byron, who is there pushing, would we get, get in the van, bring him over to the racetrack, and there's Shirley with him. And it was delightful to see him being wheeled off the van because the horses um, just went crazy. The sta all, the sta all the stabled horses would just start screaming and yelling and winnowing, whatever it is that they do. Um, and this picture is him uh, in, you know, joyfully seeing one of those horses. It was a filly that he particularly liked. But that was what he wanted to do as he died. This is how he wanted to die. His uh, dying wish from us, which we did not honor, was that he be, be, be uh, buried in one of the big manure dumps because he thought that was fertilizer for the future. Um, but that had been his life. He, by the way, um, couldn't read or write. He had really never left the racetrack because he felt safe there. Um, then I learned a lot from this other woman who was also in our respite program at the time with Tommy. Um, and she, I, I had known on the streets when we were doing our street work, I was out on a van a couple nights a week and would see her all the time. She lived, um, she lived uh, on a stoop downtown and she drank like crazy and was very open about 
on it, called herself a bag lady, was always dressed in rags. And the way she kept you away was to surround herself by the smelliest, rankest thing she could. She would buy milk and leave it there for weeks. She would buy, um, she would get uh, boiled eggs and just let them rot there. Um, and you would never, that was her defense against the world. And on the van, we just kept trying to work with her, take sandwiches and win her over slowly. And what happened is she ended up um, getting very sick and went to Mass General uh, back in the early 90s and got hepatitis C from a blood transfusion. Um, and when you continue to drink with hepatitis C, you can end up with liver cancer and all sorts of problems, including cirrhosis. And here she is many years later now, um, dying of cirrhosis and awaiting a liver transplant. But the surgeons won't do the transplant unless we could show six months of what they called residential stability and six months of her being able to stay sober. So she came to our McGinnis house and we made an exception and left, kept, let her stay there the whole time. She did great. She um, never drank. We would send a urine to the surgeons every week. Um, she was just one of the most delightful patients we ever had. And uh, one Sunday morning, I came in and she said, would you mind taking my picture? And uh, up until then, I never took pictures of anyone because I thought that was kind of voyeuristic or taking advantage of people. And she got all dressed up. I'd never seen her in anything but rags, put this linen dress on. I don't know how much you can appreciate from afar. Um, she has lipstick on, her hair's in a bun. She's got nail polish on. She really... Uh, I was stunned at how beautiful she looked. And she also went outside, picked some flowers and put them in the styrofoam cup right by her bedside table and then wanted me to take this picture. And I took it, um, you, know, you know, printed it out that afternoon and put it in a little throwaway frame and brought it to her. And I went, put on my oncology hat and I was thinking, you know, I know what's going on. She's very afraid of this big surgery coming up to replace her liver um, or, you know, transplant the liver. And um, I figured she might want to be talking about facing death and all of that. So I sat down to have the talk with her. And she looked at me in her own wonderful way, you know, put her arm around me and said, you know what, I'm not afraid of dying at all. She said, I've been out there for 28 years on the streets and death is ever present. I face death every night. Most nights, she said, I would welcome it. So I'm not afraid of death at all. And then she um, blew me away by saying that what she was really worried about was that she had two daughters. One was three years old and the other was five years old when she last saw them. Um, and that was about 28 years ago. And she said, I don't know where they are or what's going on, but if they ever could go looking for, for their birth mother, I want to be sure there's a picture of someone they might be proud of. And so this picture was all in the hopes or in case her daughters would come looking for and there would be something that they could look at that would uh, do that. So I, I kind of, you know, jumped back, as you can imagine at this, I was blown away. And what it, what dawned on me is that, you know, homelessness in America is a, people are very, very impoverished, but certainly for a single adults living in the, in the major cities, and I suspect in the suburbs and the rural areas, it's also exquisitely lonely. So it's, it's, it's very lonely poverty. I worked in a little, you know, for times in Africa, I worked in Haiti, where I saw a desperate poverty. But interestingly, I never saw the kind of loneliness I see. I when I would be at the hospital in Haiti, somebody would be admitted, the family would come, the kids would be running around, there'd be music, it would be desperately poor, and people might be sick, but there was family and people around. In our world, there's almost no one around. People die alone. And COVID, if it has shown us nothing else, we have one, one uh, patient who is reminds me all the time and he said the only silver lining of COVID is that maybe the rest of the society will now understand how lonely it has been for us homeless people all along. Uh, and at any rate, the funny end of this story was I came in a couple days later after I'd given her the picture and there were 22 people who asked me, there was a little thing, asked me to take their portraits. And now in our respite program, we have portraits of people. Um, and where I thought once people would never want anything like that, and it was really voyeuristic, people are very honored to have pictures of themselves looking good that they can put up on the wall and say, I've been here. So um, we, we have a kind of funny struggle often when someone comes into our respite program, if they, we don't have a portrait of them, they feel very hurt. And we have to figure out how to do it. That's not everyone, mind you, but it is a surprising majority of people really looking for that. I would never have guessed that. Um, another thing I'd love to share with you is that as we've gone out to try to take 
care of people in the, in the you know on the streets in the shelters you know out in encampments um you can do a ton of work caring for them out there you can engage them earn their trust but this is a very sick population um and as you would not be surprised about 80 percent of everybody we take care of on the streets anyway um, are suffering from a co-occurring burden of a medical problem or more with a psychiatric illness or more, as well as a substance use disorder. So coping with all of those requires a really integrated approach to their health care. And you actually need that you need access to the hospitals and the specialty care and the imaging that comes with that. So one of our uh, mandates all along has our doctors and our nurses have to stay part of the hospital because homeless people, when they get sick, want to know that we can at least be involved in their care when they get admitted to the hospital. Um, and so on, this is our, uh, we have a, a clinic here at MGH five days a week for homeless people, but on Thursdays we have a dedicated street clinic which is designed to um, remove as much of the stigma as we can of people coming right off the streets, not able to shower, usually in, you know, not able to get clean clothing. And this is, we have a couple of exam rooms right in the medical walk-in, so we don't call it the homeless clinic, it's right in the mainstream walk-in. And uh, the exam rooms are pretty small, and I took this one so you get a flavor for when our team comes and has our meeting, this is what it looks like. So we have um, way little space for way much to do but it is a delightful way to deal with the team. So we have two exam rooms like this. Um, this is downstairs where the waiting room is and uh, Stephanie's our nurse and she's talking to this woman, Leslie. And I, I love this picture because what I've learned about this is we used to think, oh God, it's Mass General Hospital. People must be really happy to be going to the hospital, going to MGH. It turns out they don't care at all about that it's Mass General. What they care about is who is it they're gonna see. And when they've seen one of our clinicians outside on the street, in this case, it was me, I had seen this woman on a Wednesday night, and this is Thursday morning. So she was willing to come into the clinic to see me. She wasn't willing to go into the clinic just to go to the clinic. And we've all in our team learned that lesson. We all share in the care of everybody. But this is this is Leslie inside. The night before I had seen her here, this is where she lives. She lives in a on a stoop right outside, um, this is in the financial district. And that's all her stuff. What she does is when she walks around town, she leapfrogs these many buggies and carts one at a time over each other. And then it takes her forever to walk about a block. Um, but the reason we wanted her in is she has terrible diabetes. And for those of you who are medical, her hemoglobin A1C was 17 at the time we took this picture. So we finally convinced her to come in. She had known us for years and now she's in a nursing home and actually doing really well. She's kind of the, the um, head of the patient advocacy committee at this nursing home. Um, her diabetes is under great control. And I realized that took about 20 years of winning her trust before we could cash in on that. But patience and um, perseverance and consistency is really the name of uh, all of you who are doing street medicine know that that's the name of the game. It's another, this is the clinic on Valentine's Day. This is Daryl, who is one of our favorites, who came in to give uh, the nurses their flowers. And he's really, I have no, we have no idea where he got those flowers, but we decided we weren't going to ask him about that. But Daryl usually stays, this is him in the middle. He usually, he sleeps outside. And this is with two of his friends. Um, and he spent 25 years, 24 years living on the streets like this, one of the most you know, delightful, wonderful guys. And um, about a year ago, he was, he was at a Boston Celtics game trying to stem or ask for money afterwards. And he got in some sort of an argument with someone who then stabbed him to death and it was a crusher for us. So um, the, the presence of death is really one of the hardest things for us to deal with, um, for our staff to deal with, including myself. And this is Greg who came, you know, was a regular at the clinic as well. And he asked me to take this picture and he wanted to be holding a cigarette that's lit. He doesn't really smoke, but he thinks it looks very cool to um, have a cigarette. And this is a Sitco sign, which everybody in Boston knows is right near Fenway Park where the Red Sox play. And this is where Greg used to hang out. In fact, I met Greg, this picture was taken probably in 2010. And I met him in 1985 when he was living up under these up in these uh, steel girders with his mother and his sister. And he was 14 at the time. He had escaped school and everything else. And you can see, I showed this before, he was staying up here. I don't know if you can appreciate, these are I-beams supporting the road and these are boards that they put across the I-beams and then people climb up and crawl in there. And they're pretty hidden away, but that's where Greg spent, um, he spent about 10 years living there with his mother and his sister. Um, and then um, what, what, 
finally happened is as Greg got older, we got him into housing. Um, and um, at the beginning of COVID, he had a cough and um, called up and we said, well, come on in, let's take a look at you. And he came in, it was in March a year ago. And he not only had a cough, he was coughing up a little bit of blood. And it turned out he had a huge cancer in his lungs, which had gone into his brain and into his bones. And Greg was dead within about for 48 hours from the time he came in to see us. Um, and I remember what was so surprising back then was we had to bag him because there were no ventilators available. This was when ventilators were really at a premium, um, but he had did not have COVID. Um, and um, it was a crusher for us because we had known him for so long, but this was his best friend, Billy, and they're both in the clinic uh, when I took this picture. Billy was uh, upstairs and he um, was another character like Greg. By the way, neither Billy or Greg could read or write, but 25% of the people who live on the streets of Boston, live on the streets, cannot read or write. So you know that the issue, uh, the, the issue of their homelessness goes back to when they were children and what services they did not get and what needs were not. Um, taken care of. But anyway, Billy, um, when he was, he smiles and, you know, has everything. He's got AIDS, he has hepatitis C, he has um, awful diabetes. He's currently in the hospital because he needs some dialysis. Um, and what he doesn't show here is that when he was five years old, he was caught in the riots of, 19, this was in 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated and Boston had serious riots. And he was caught as a five-year-old on the front lawn of his uh, apartment complex and somebody poured gasoline over him and set him on fire. So what you can't tell here is that everything below his neck is burned. And he spent about a year and a half as a little kid in the burn hospital right next to Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and um, has had probably you know 150 to 200 surgeries to release the skin over, over time. And he lives in relatively constant pain uh, but somehow, um, you know, is resilient through all of that. And when I first met him, I thought he was a pain in the neck and I, you know, he was kind of sassy and all that stuff. But like Greg, as you finally get to understand this story, then you start to realize that these are, these are people living with incredible courage. Greg on, the, on his left, when we finally got a chance to do a formal IQ, he, it was less than 50. And so he's never had a chance, never had any services, and didn't ha did, did not have a, a hope of getting a job that he could keep. Yet everybody blamed him as uh, as kind of a malingerer. So one lesson I think we've all learned is never judge by what you see. It takes years sometimes to understand the story. But if people have been out there a long time, I can promise you their story is usually a mind blower, and they are they are dealing with a hand that none of us would really want to deal with or probably be able to deal with. So there's an huge amount of courage being shown. Uh, this is Mark, I thought I'd show you, this is another one of our really wonderful guys. He was a Mi'kmaq Indian from the Mi'kmaq tribe, which is one of our, they live in Maine and he's just, you know, he was a, a tribal expert. He was really fun, but he um, lived outside. And this is a picture when he was out in a park at Mass General um, when he wasn't feeling well and he ended up getting uh, pancreatic cancer and died all alone in the hospital. I mean, we were there, but he died in the hospital alone. Um, and one issue that comes up all the time is how do you memorialize people as they're passing? And we've known from the people we care for is it's important that they know friends or community or someone remembers that they passed this way. So we try to have have a service whenever we can for anyone who died, often outside, but whenever we can get access to it, sometimes it'll be you know, in a chapel. And his service um, was in St. It was actually in St. Anthony Shrine, which is the downtown shrine, which is for people who are working who want to stop into a chapel. And they have a Lazarus uh, pro project and they will um, you know, provide a funeral, do a funeral and provide a burial site for people who have nothing and no one in there. So this was the funeral. There were about six of us who attended the funeral, but I want you to check who's playing the cello. Ooh, I'm so sorry. I don't know if it comes across, but that's Yo-Yo Ma, who is not a bad cellist, who was the musician playing at his funeral attended by six or five, five or six people. And Yo-Yo Ma, like many people that I have come to know in my life now, have done these remarkable things quietly to just honor homeless people who have not been given the same privileges many of us have. So I thought I just wanted to honor Yo-Yo on that. I don't know how many of you follow his music, but he is clearly the world's best cellist. Um, and I think I'm down to the last story I wanna tell you because I don't have a quick sense of the time here. So if you allow me this one last story and then I'd love to 
see if you have any questions. But these are two people that, um, for me, you know, one of the mandates we had was how do we establish continuity of care? The people that, when I came to be a doctor back in 1985, I was going to do this for a year, and everybody hated that idea. They said, "Look, if we're going to, you're going to become our doctor. You're not allowed to just leave after a year. You're going to stick with it." And the issue for our program all along is how do we get doctors and nurses and social workers who are going to do this as a career, not as just a a, a, a wayside stop. Not that that is bad. Don't get me wrong, but the goal is to have continuity of care. So these are two people that I've known forever. Brad, who's standing up, is a uh, Vietnam War veteran. He was a Green Beret. He used to go down into tunnels, what, he was, what they call the tunnel rat. Um, and he did two tours of duty in Vietnam, came back and uh, was on the streets. And I have no idea what the real reason why he ended up on the streets was, but he then spent the next, you know, that he came back from Vietnam in 1973 and has been on the streets since. Consent. And then he befriended Charles, who was very different than Brad, because Brad's a tough green beret. Charles was uh, just a gentle human being who um, was uh, just really wonderful. But Charles had gotten AIDS early on back in 1985, and he was my only patient, I remember, of the hundreds I was taking care of at the time, who did not seem to get sick from HIV. Um, and he became what we eventually learned with what's called long-term non-responders non-progressives, excuse me. And so he um, did well. And Charles, in his own inimical way, knew he was doing well because he had adopted a, a, a diet back then, which in today's age, we would call it vegan, but it was really a, you know, it was mostly kale and all these other things. But he was very convinced that that was what was keeping the virus at bay in his system. So this picture I took about four years ago now, when he came into the clinic and he wasn't doing well for the first time, we had gotten them both. They had been on the streets for years, stayed in the shelter a bit. We'd got them housed through a housing program. We were visiting them at home, but he started to have a cough, didn't feel well, didn't look well. And we did his blood tests and he clearly now had a CD4 count, which was plummeting, meaning the virus was now active in his system. We didn't know why, and we didn't know whether he got a new strain of it or what. But um, I, I had a talk with him. I said, Charles, look, this is perfect. We have a pill a day. You can take one pill a day and this will keep it at bay. And I thought I had gained his trust and confidence and that he knew I was, well, at least he thought I might be a good doctor. But he, he um, said, no, you know, he knew what had happened. He had cut way down on the kale in his diet and he was going to put the kale back and he would be fine. And I pleaded with him as did Charles who was his partner, um, and he wouldn't have anything to do with it. And about, um, I would say, less than a month after I took that picture, he came into the hospital with what's called pneumocystis pneumonia and died in the ICU of something which I realized was entirely preventable, and I felt terrible about it. And Brad, who had been his partner now all these years, um, was equally devastated, um, and he stopped eating. His grief was just too much. Um, and I, we have a psychiatrist in our team. We visited him frequently. We're trying to figure out how to deal with his grief reaction. Um, but it then started, it lasted longer and he was losing more weight than we thought. And we finally had to just bring him against his will into the hospital because he just didn't seem like he was thinking right. And it turned out he was losing weight because he had a terrible cancer um, that had gone through from his thyroid to all of his bones into his, into his brain. And Brad died, I would say six, six uh, within six to eight weeks at the time Charles died. Um, and it was really typical for us all. But when I was looking through um, my things, I found this picture, which I had taken of the two of them back in 1985. So about 32 years earlier, um, when they had decided they were out at Long Island shelter and I was doing the clinic and they asked me if I would take their wedding picture. Um, and remember, this is 1985. This was not a politically correct thing to be doing, especially in a shelter, which has very, you know, the, the politics and shelters can be all over the place. But they were committed to each other. And they decided they were going to get married, had this ceremony on the island, to which just about everybody in the shelter, about 500 people, attended and celebrated with them. And they accepted them for who they are, uh, way before any of us was, were really understanding what and how to accept. But anyway, that was a winning picture. And I just wanted to share with you that these two folks who I thought, what's going on here, stayed together 
in this kind of really kind of in many ways remarkably loving relationship for the next 30 years and died pretty much together. So hidden sometimes in all of this uh, chaos that you see among homeless people are these stunning stories of love and devotion. Um, and last thing I want to do as I finish up here is just, uh, and I'll I'll stop and ask some questions, but we also had a huge outbreak of um, COVID in the shelters of Boston. We have about, um, we had 40, almost 40% of everybody living in the shelters came down with COVID and our entire program uh, transformed overnight trying to take care of this. Um, we were screening everybody going in into the shelter. Um, and then those who screened positive, we'd send up for testing. We sent up tents so that we could isolate and quarantine people because you can't do that in the large shelters. And then we converted our our respite program into a the top floor was essentially a COVID unit. So we had 52 people almost all of the time with COVID, homeless people with COVID, who we were taking care of. And then it overwhelmed us. And we, uh, as you can see here, this is the only, I was promising myself not to show any busy slides, but this is just to show you how many people got COVID as we tested. The only way we could find them is to test them in the shelters. Um, almost all of it was asymptomatic, which was really horrifying because the, the screening for symptoms meant essentially was useless. What we had to do is test everybody going to every shelter every two weeks, um, which was a huge burden of work, but that was the only way we could get control of stuff. And then when um, so many people got it, we had to work. We were given by the governor and the mayor 500 beds in the convention center next to 500 bed uh, hospital. And we ran these 500 beds for homeless and poor people with COVID during that first wave back in the spring and su early summer. Um, and it was, it was quite amazing. That's what it looked like. And right now what we're doing is basically vaccinating everyone we can. We've vaccinated about so far now, uh, almost 60% of everybody living in the shelters of Boston has been vaccinated now. And we're using all of our spread out clinics to do that. And now we're even, uh, with the single shot, single dose uh, vaccinations now, which can be kept in a regular, like regular refrigerator. This is our, two of our staff out with the vac vaccines, trying to find people on the street in the, in the uh, uh, South Station, which is our Amtrak, and even right on the giving shots right outside. So um, there's hope on the horizon, and we're realizing more and more of the homeless folks, much to our surprise, are saying yes to a vaccine and not no. I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions, and I hope, if I've done nothing else, just to show you that it's been a long, long learning process. And most of what we learned, we learned from those people working in shelters. We learned it from the nurses who were caring for people. And mostly I think we learned it from the people who are taking care of um, ourselves. And if anything I've learned, I think if, you know, if I rattle it all down, it's that people, you know, people know how they wanna be cared for and you should listen to them and figure out how we can adapt our ways to match their ways. Let me up there, but thank you once again. I am so in awe of your medical school and of what's going on at WSU. Um, and I can't wait to get out there when, when these travel restrictions are finally over. But thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Connell. That was a beautiful presentation, very profound, very moving. Um, uh, it, was just, it was just really wonderful. Um, there was a definite theme throughout your presentation about dignity and how you treat your um, patients, how the patients are all treated and definitely a theme of courage um, from all of your patients too that really did come across um, in your presentation. I think my favorite quote from you, Dr. O'Connell, was the feet are the entry to the soul. I love that, that is um, so fantastic and so profound. I do wanna give a quick shout out to some viewers that we have from our own Spokane Street Medicine um, who um, are also watching right now. So thank you to Spokane Street Medicine for all that you are doing and, and really all of the healthcare um, uh, professionals that are out um, watching right now. So a couple of questions have um, come in, Dr. O'Connell. Um, the first one I'll start with is about ACEs. Um, can you comment on any efforts to document the adverse childhood experiences of the homeless population you've worked with? That is a, such a great question. And I, I can comment only in that, um, I would start by saying, You'd think there'd be a lot of research done on homelessness, but it turns out there's there's not there's very there's small research project, but no very big ones. If you go to um, my wife, for example, just finished her doctorate a few years ago at the School of Public Health at Harvard. She worked as a PA on the streets for many years, um, and when she finished, it was very clear there was not anyone at Harvard School of Public Health 
who has homelessness as a topic that they have been able to pursue. And it's primarily because there's no national money that comes in to fund homeless studies. So there are no mentors, which means everybody has to go do some. And we have yet to find anyone who doesn't score so high, it becomes meaningless. So the adverse childhood events, um, you know, are just legion in this population. And when I think about ways to prevent homelessness or ways to end it, um, it's got to go back to childhood because we've got to fix our schools, fix our welfare systems, you know, fi fix the income disparities, you know, and of course, you know, overwhelming all of this is the poverty and the racism that, that um, pervades it all. So that's where the solutions are going to be. And what we've had to come to accept is we're taking care of people who have, whose the, the, the determinants of their health happened 40 years ago. And what we're doing now is really more palliative care than it is changing their their lives. And that's a hard thing for clinicians like myself to accept. Great. Thank you. Um, going off of that one, I'm going to combine a couple questions here. Um, knowing that a lot of this is preventable with the homeless population, um, how do you cope with this? Um, and what keeps you going on the day to day? And, you know, how does that help with some of the biggest challenges that you see in your work? You know, that's an, another great question. And I, we, we talk about that a lot in our program. Um, it's almost a paradox because what what happens to you know we have you know what I think I meant, might have mentioned we have about forty doctors in our program now and about thirty doctors and forty nurse practitioners and PAs, and we all go through sort of a certain cycle. You start taking care of people who are um, homeless and living you know living through all of that, and you get enraged at a system that would allow this to happen. At the same time, you're trying to take care of somebody. Um, and then what you start to realize is that, uh, you know, I'm a doctor and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say my, I'm gonna advocate and do what I can to fix this. But in fact, you know, this is a big societal problem and I'm not gonna change it myself. I need partners. But in the meantime, I'm getting to know the people that I'm taking care of. And every one of our staff will tell you the joy comes in getting to know people and in being there to take care of them. Even though you may, may not be changing the big trajectory, their day-to-day -day life and the friendships and the love and the care and the kindness, all of that becomes what drives you. And most people who come and work with us, which is really interesting, and I hadn't thought about this, are surprised that it's kind of a joyful day-to-day -day life. <laughs> it's just a horrible big picture issue. So that's the living paradox we have to kind of cope with. Great, thank you. You talked a lot about um, destigmatizing healthcare um, with your patients. And so we have a question here about how do you help destigmatize homelessness um, within the rest of the community so that the rest of the community can, can understand and realize the vulnerability that this population faces? It's another, it's a really piercing and difficult question. Um, what a couple of thoughts on this, and I, you know, I, I don't have any answers, by the way. So well, all I can tell you is we hope that as we get to know people and, and be witness to their stories, people will understand how complicated um, their lives have been and how difficult they've been. And you people should will understand. So when you, if you ran into Greg or Billy on the street, you would think they were just malingerers or people that are wise. But as you understand what they've been through, then they become much more, um, much more lovable in a way. Um, what um, I think, you know, what I worry about a lot, you know, is we're in a world now where there's the haves and the have nots, the income disparities are growing. Um, and the backlash is toward those people who are, you know, have very little. And I don't know, you know, I, I think we really need a, a real societal look at what are we gonna do here? Because I don't see, even in a, a really progressive town like ours, um, it's really hard to, you know, if you want to, you know, build a home to have for homeless people, it takes you years to get through the community process and all of that stuff. It's still just, even though it's not overt, it's sort of a, a covert um, bias against doing the services that would, will be there to help people who are poor and homeless. So I'm, I'm worried and skeptical that we're not ready yet as a society to make the kind of investment in addressing this problem that is going to be needed. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Connell. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time um, for the talk today. Um, I want to thank you very much. We are so honored to have you as our guest this year. 
Um, you've given two presentations to us today, and I know there's a time change involved too. So <laughs> thank you so much. And we've very, been very fortunate to hear about medicine in the streets um, and all that you've done. Um, we also want to thank the Steer family and the Robert F. E. Steer Lecture in Medicine um, for bringing us together today. Um, everyone that is watching this out there, thank you all of, for all of the viewers. You will be emailed a recorded um, presentation, so um, you can watch this um, again as you wish. And we want to thank you all for registering um, to attend the Robert F. E. Steer Lecture in Medicine. And um, we wish you all well. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. You're terrific.